The Mafia was well known for their involvement in a wide range of criminal activities, for their ruthlessness in disposing of enemies, and for their many shady dealings. There's a long list of people and organizations who, in one way or another, were in the Mafia's pockets. They paid off police officers, judges, politicians. They controlled entire industries. And for a long time, they mostly got away with it. There is proof that the Mafia was once so powerful, their connections reached up to the highest offices in the country. Some of the stories are likely myths, but some are certainly true. The Mafia was involved in American war efforts. The CIA did approach mobsters to assassinate Cuban leader Fidel Castro, and there's even believable evidence that links the Mafia to the assassination of U.S. President John F. Kennedy. In this bonus episode, we'll look at the connection between the Mafia and the American establishment. From politicians, law enforcement, the CIA, and the unions, the mob collaborated with the state and officials on many occasions. And being the Mafia, they always expected something in return. This is Mafia, the establishment. Selwyn Rabb is a former New York Times crime reporter and author of Five Families. The Mafia had at least 50 or 60 years of a golden era. Most of it was due uh, essentially to J. Edgar Hoover, who ran the FBI from the 1920s until his death in 1972. Hoover did not want to tackle the Mafia for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason, it meant long, difficult investigations that might not bear fruit. He wanted his statistical records made it easy for him to go before Congress and get the kind of money he wanted, uh, budgets that he wanted. And he didn't want to interfere with politics or the politics in big cities like New York, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, uh, in which the mafia had sort of either uh, open or uh, or, or rather furtive control of the Democratic Party. So in that sense, if, if Hoover had gone after the uh, organized crime in ma many of major cities in America, he would have embarrassed the Democratic Party and sometimes the Republican Party. So he had a hands-off policy. In addition to that, Hoover was obsessed with leftist organizations, which he considered subversive after World War II. And it was easy going after what he considered the alleged Reds, or Communists, or Socialists. And his statistical, his bent was to get good statistics. The easiest way to get good statistics, recovering stolen cars, bank robberies. He went after the easy crime, so it made it look like the FBI was tremendously effective. J. Edgar Hoover was a law enforcement hero. But when it came to tackling organized crime, he wanted no part of it. On, and as part of that problem for Hoover was he didn't have the personnel, the kinds of people who could really investigate the mafia. Uh, most of the agents uh, under his domain came from small towns or Midwestern America or the South, and they didn't have the culture or the idea about how could, they could infiltrate. It would be difficult, and they didn't, have the, they didn't have the savvy. They didn't have the knowledge, so they never tackled the mob. And it took a long time, it took after Hoover's death, another 10 years, before the FBI suddenly discovered they had another priority, and that priority was the influence and the effect and the devastating impact that the Mafia was having on America. In the early 1930s, Lucky Luciano and the Commission began to exert an enormous amount of power over many parts of American society. Nothing was off-limits, not even intervening in politics. Frank Costello, a close friend and ally of Luciano, had ties to Tammany Hall in New York. Since 1786, Tammany Hall had been THE New York political organization, hugely influential among its immigrant base of supporters. Using the Democrats' political party machine, Costello was able to influence the nominations of candidates in local and state elections. Thomas Repetto is the author of American Mafia. Frank Costello was the prime minister of New York organized crime uh, back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, 
that doesn't mean that he was the boss of bosses. There was no such position. But he was first among equals and probably a little more equal than all the others. Uh, he was the one who made the political connections for the mob. Actually, Frank ended up in control of Tammany Hall, which was for 100 years the leading political organization in New York City. Uh, but Tammany fell on hard times in the 1930s, and Frank became the most powerful figure. The test came when the district attorney's office, uh, office was monitoring a wiretap on Frank's phone. And he got a call from a man who had just been slated for a judgeship, thanking him for getting him a state Supreme Court uh, judgeship. And it turned out that he had beat out a candidate rec recommended by a man named Franklin D. Roosevelt. Roosevelt recommended a congressman as a reward. Costello called the leader of Tammany Hall and said, you know, are you a man or a mouse? I want you to put my guy in. And he did. Of course, the leader got fired, but the other man ascended to the bench. And Costello really had the majority of the votes on the council of Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall temporarily lost some of its power when New York Mayor James Walker was forced from office after a corruption scandal. And when Franklin D. Roosevelt became U.S. president, his New Deal would help alter the demographic landscape of New York by restricting immigration and making people less dependent on Tammany for jobs and assistance. But while Tammany Hall was weakening, the Mafia continued to grow in strength, especially in New York City. They were able to influence decision-making at Tammany Hall well into the 60s. Here's Selwyn Rabb again. In the latter part of the year 20th century, there's no question, New York had a secret government and it was known as Cosa Nostra or the Mafia. They had influence or actually controlled some of the most important industries in the city. They ran the garbage industry, the private garbage collection industry. They had a, a, a hammer hold over the garment industry about how uh, shipments moved in and out of the city. They also uh, had an immense influence in the construction industry. No major project was built in the city from for over 40 or 50 years in which the Mafia didn't get a secret profit. And all along the line, these were secret taxes, hidden taxes. And it wasn't just some kind of innocent uh, association between business people and organized crime figures. These, uh, the, the graft and the influence and the loot that the Mafia got were taxes and they were passed along to the public. So all along the line, the Mafia cashed in. And for the most part, Law enforcement and the uh, civil authorities did nothing about it. This was just the way things worked in the major cities where organized crime had a stronghold. In Chicago, the Outfit was an underground crime organization that played a major role in Illinois state politics. Mobsters there were able to raid the pension fund of the mighty Teamsters Union. Millions of dollars were borrowed to invest in hotels and casinos in Las Vegas, and not a penny was paid back. When Sam Giancana was the boss of the outfit, mob influence would reach the highest offices in the country. Peter Vera was an attorney on the Chicago Strike Force. Organized crime has tentacles into legitimate business. They, um, they're in business to be in business. So, it's, uh, so they need to reach in and have uh, tentacles into the police department, uh, uh, have a police department uh, officials are on their side, in maybe the state prosecutor's office, uh, the attorney general's office, uh, Department of Insurance. And uh, they need to have those persons in case they need a favor. They need a favor or uh, let them know if there's a raid going to be uh, coming. Uh, the, the police will, on the QT, let them know there's a raid going to be on one of their, their gambling establishments uh, so that they can not close it down but, you know, get everything out of it if they have to. Uh, they, uh, 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 there's no question in my mind they have judges on their payroll so that if something comes up and it gets to them, they can go to the judge and the judge will take care of it and uh, maybe not throw it out. but. Uh, uh, take some action that would certainly, certainly slow things down. They have persons over in, in, in the licensing bureaus, the persons uh, uh, who license bars. Uh, so in case of any of their problems, it gets, uh, the bars get in trouble, they take care of that. 
and the organized crime is in the business of being in business, and they need to have persons in, in the hierarchy of, of corporations and, and in the government to help them smooth their way. That there's not just a bunch of gangsters shooting up the countryside. And, and as time has passed, we saw, we have seen just how, how powerful they are in, in the limit of their uh, infiltration. Let's face it, even mobsters need therapy sometimes. Look at Tony Soprano. But in today's non-stop high-speed world, finding time in your day to talk with a therapist face-to-face -face is getting harder and harder. Which is why I'm excited that today's show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company that lets you message a licensed therapist from anywhere at any time. If you're listening to me, you probably have a computer or smartphone. That means you can start improving your mental health right now, even if you've had trouble making time for it in the past. Look, therapy isn't just about venting your innermost thoughts or digging into childhood memories. It's about practical, everyday strategies for managing stress and living a happier, healthier life. A therapist is simply someone for you to talk to. It just happens they're trained to listen and help you make positive changes in your life. The Talkspace platform has over 2,000 licensed therapists. These are real therapists. And they're experienced in addressing all of the life challenges we face. You'll get matched with the perfect therapist for your needs, at a fraction of the price of traditional therapy. And as a loyal Mafia listener, you can get $45 off your first month by going to Talkspace.com forward slash Mafia and using the code Mafia. Plus, you'll be showing your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com forward slash Mafia and use the code Mafia for $45 off. With Talkspace, therapy is as easy as sending your therapist a message. When it came to politics, the mob didn't have any party allegiance. They were interested in any candidate they thought would turn a blind eye to their illegal business interests and let them be. In 1960, John F. Kennedy announced he was running for president, but his path to becoming the Democrats' nominee was steep. A Boston Irish Catholic couldn't get elected to anything in staunchly Protestant states like West Virginia. But did the wealthy Kennedy clan buy support in these key primary elections? Did singer Frank Sinatra really put Kennedy patriarch Joe in touch with mob boss Sam Giancana? Professor Robert Blakey is an attorney who has spent his life at the forefront of fighting organized crime. He's worked for the Department of Justice and helped draft the powerful RICO law. Giancana is a principal, not an agent. Joseph Kennedy is a principal, not an agent. That two principals would have sat down and had that conversation is unbelievable. They would have, if, it, if there had been contacts between the two, which I wouldn't preclude, uh, it would have been through indirect means. For example, I have every reason to believe that there was mob money in, in the uh, West Virginia election, and I have that from several different sources. Uh, the person who handled the money was Frank Sinatra. You don't buy votes as such, but you, you give people walking around money is what it's called, and they encourage other people to come to the polls. Hubert Humphrey should have won that thing hands down. He didn't. Money, superior organization, uh, and I think the Kennedy machine would, and Joe Kennedy did not spend money where he didn't have to spend money. That's how he got to be rich. The rich are normally not generous. The money was there, it was used and used wisely, and next thing you know, he wins in West Virginia, and that knocks out Humphrey as a practical matter for the nomination. That I believe. Kennedy won the primary, then the presidency, and apparently Sam Giancana was influential in his winning Illinois. 
David Shippers was a trial attorney in the Department of Justice from 1962 to 1967. Well, number one, he would deliver the votes whenever they needed it. The first ward was always notorious for bringing in the votes. As not only the first ward, though, but a number of the wards were controlled by mafia or outfit people. And they could, they could make or break somebody. They put their own people in as aldermen. I mean, the first ward for years. I mean, back, going back to Al Capone and, uh, the, and Hinky Dink Kenna, Bathhouse John, they were, that was all first war. And they had, they, they had a number of their individuals in the state legislature. Uh, they could deliver the vote and they could destroy you. If they, if they put the word out that they weren't going to, you're not to vote for X, X was dead, X couldn't win. And that's how Giancana kept the thing going. I have no proof, obviously, but my, in my opinion, in my opinion, Giancana was contacted by Joe Kennedy out here in Chicago. Now that we know happened. Remember that the FBI was following these people all the time. I am, in my mind, and convinced that there was a deal cut. That uh, if Giancana would get uh, Chicago, get Illinois for the Democrats, that he would be given free hand. Sam Giancana and the Chicago outfit were convinced they had played a major role in getting Kennedy elected president. So when their new ally in the White House named none other than his brother, Robert Kennedy, as attorney general, the mob was outraged. Here's Robert Blakey again, who worked with Bobby Kennedy. Giancana and the mob wanted in Chicago was not a Republican assistant attorney, not a Republican United States attorney. The former United States attorney under Nixon had been a Republican, and he had no qualms against bringing prosecutions in the city against anybody. The thought was, if you would get a Democratic president, he would get you a Democratic United States attorney, and maybe a Democrat United States attorney, and you, the, the United States attorneys are appointed by the president, but in fact they're appointed by the local, the people. The Mayor Daley would have an, a heavy influence, the, the senators would have an influence, the Congress would have an influence, and Giancana would have an influence. You wouldn't want a corrupt person. You'd want a corrupt person if you get it, but you couldn't get that. But you could get a person Jim kind of things, who would not be active in any way with things that are of concern to us. So, Giancana can legitimately think that he had done his work and the Democrat, that close on election that night, that he had tipped it and that he could expect some, some result. There are other surveillance that indicated that Sinatra believed that he would get something out of having, remember he sang at the, the President's inaugural ball and Sinatra was a friend of the, the Kennedy family, the family, and Jack Kennedy in, in particular, and thought he would get something. The last thing they thought was they would get Robert Kennedy as the Attorney General. John F. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963. The conspiracy theories as to who killed the U.S. president are still alive today. Some believe the mob was involved. Robert Blakey was the chief counsel of the 1976 House Select Committee on Assassinations. So Kennedy uh, was, in his uh, uh, presidency, not immune from organized crime retaliation because he had taken votes uh, and, and taken money uh, from the mob. Uh, Giancana and the other members uh, uh, could well have plotted and, and killed him. The real question is not whether they had the motive, opportunity, and means, is whether they actually did it. Uh, one thing about the Kennedy assassination is it's sort of like murder on the Orient Express. 
There's so many people who could have done it, and it's and they could have all been conspirators. Uh, that the question is not who had a motive to do it, but who did it. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that the mafia as a whole was not responsible for Lee Harvey Oswald. But I can came to a conclusion at the time, working for the committee, that the mafia as a whole had not There's one connection between the mob and the state that no one can deny. The CIA asked the Mafia for help on more than one occasion. Uh, whenever they work, whenever the law enforcement people, CIA or even the FBI or the, or the U.S. Navy, want to have something done with the Mafia, their main concern is not to be embarrassed. As long as they could keep it hush-hush, fine. As long as they could get credit or get something accomplished, fine. Obviously, they never wanted to be linked, but that didn't stop them from trying to use the mafia when it was vital. In 1959, there was a new enemy just 90 miles off the U.S. coast. Fidel Castro had won the Cuban Revolution, and the CIA wanted to get rid of the communist leader as soon as possible. The mob lost millions of dollars in gambling money when the Cuban casinos shut down, so they were extremely interested in the deal. The major players in the initial stages of the plot were Sam Giancana, his right-hand man John Rosselli, and Florida Don, king of casinos, Santo Traficante. For the CIA to get involved with the mafia was probably naive on the part of the CIA. Some people, like uh, the the agents that they sent to deal with uh, with Giancana and Roselli and those guys thought that they would make them big men in the agency, but realistically, they should have asked, "What can the CIA do to protect me in Chicago?" And they didn't have that kind of power, uh, and so they probably should have never gotten involved. And the CIA should have said, "These guys aren't trained assassins or something." Such groups exist in other parts of the world, and America could have hired them, but they hired these mob guys who really weren't capable of doing the job. And there were efforts, ineffectual, obviously, uh, uh, to kill the Castro. Now, that's a scandal uh, in, in, in our history of our government. What the real scandal involved is the assumption on the part of the CIA that the Mafia was a group of hired killers. Typically, a, a, a killing by the Mafia, a, a Mafia member, it's done to protect the family. There's no transfer of money. The mob is not an organization of hired killers that you could go to and contract a killing. The CIA was incredibly naive. Uh, so what do we know or what we, should we infer when Giancana and uh, Dr. Traficante, quote, agreed, unquote, with the, with the CIA? We should infer that the mob took the CIA. That is to say, as they took money. In 1975, Sam Giancana and his right-hand man, John Rosselli, were ordered to testify in front of the church committee, which was investigating the connections between the mob and the CIA. Rosselli was involved in the CIA mafia plots. Giancana was involved in CIA mafia plots. Just before uh, the Senate hearings, uh, when they were could have been called, they ended up disappearing. And Rosselli was eventually found chopped up in a uh, oil drum. Uh, Giancana was shot in his basement by someone who apparently let him in. In the end, the Mafia's hold over major American institutions didn't last, thanks to the work of law enforcement. 
These sometimes violent criminal attempts at gaming the system were stopped, dead in their tracks. In the next bonus episode, one of the unwritten rules of the Mafia was Omerta, the Code of Silence. No one was allowed to talk about the existence of the Mafia, reveal how it worked or who the main players were. The Mafia demanded loyalty from its members to the very end. Remember that the, the mob Cosa Nostra was a secret society. Um, the law of Omerta, which everybody had to adhere to, uh, said, said essentially you can't mention the existence of the mob or testify about anybody else. But when law enforcement started to use modern surveillance techniques to incriminate mobsters, the list of flippers began to grow longer and longer. It turns out mobsters do talk about the Mafia if it will save their own skins. We had spent years of our lives, um, you know, investigating this guy, uh, and he then cooperates after he's convicted. Within a couple of hours, he's looking to save his own skin. So I think we'd all be disappointed. We, th this is a guy who was supposed to be the last bastion of the mob. Next week, Mafia Bonus 4, The Rats. This has been an Audio Boom and World Media Rights co-production, hosted by me, Fleet Cooper. It is produced by Audio Boom's Ben Hosley and Rachel Jacobs and Bettina Vasquez for World Media Rights. We had editing help from David Markowitz, with additional production from World Media Rights by Gerald Zabengua. David McNabb is the series' creative director, and the executive producers for Audio Boom are Brendan Reagan and Stuart Last. Thanks to Talkspace for sponsoring this episode. Follow Mafia on Spotify or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And if you've got some time, give us a review. <laughs>